We're going to be talking about natural blood pressure support today. And this is such a fun topic for us because it's really a chance for us to go back into some of the medical literature and see what's really been developed over the last few years. I'm Dr. Molly Force, and I'm the clinical director here at Prosper Natural Health, and I'm joined by Dr. Rosalie DeLambert, and we are naturopathic physicians. And so what this means is our approach is very holistic. We're primary care physicians, but we like to use lifestyle dietary modifications, as well as natural uh, remedies to help people regain their health whenever possible. We also are trained in pharmaceutical management for many, um, you know, pathologies as well. And so our big piece at our clinic is that we're trying to really help people find their way through their health issues and really get to the root cause for those issues and affect their deeper pathologies and, and the physiology, which is impacting those. So we've been doing these online talks, which are just really fantastic every month. And we have a whole bunch of them online. If you'd like to check out the prior talks this is a really great way for us to answer a lot of these clinical questions that we have come up. And we get a lot of people who have hypertension, who have high blood pressure, and then people who have hypotension, which is low blood pressure coming in. And this is affecting their day-to-day -day output, their mood, their memory sometimes, as well as their cardiovascular health. So today we want to really cover what the roles of blood pressure are for the body and get you guys to understand the basic physiology. And even though some of these slides are more scientific jargon, we really want you guys and our patients to really understand what's going on in their body. Because when we understand how the body is supposed to function, function normally, we can understand strategies that can help impact re-regulating health. So we want to be thinking about things that we can do dietarily and lifestyle strategies primarily that are going to impact blood pressure. And there are so many of those out there that often get glossed over in healthcare. We also today are going to be presenting some really cool natural remedies that both affect too high of blood pressure as well as too low of blood pressure. And we're going to be presenting a lot of really cool literature that's come out in the past few years about these. So the backstory on blood pressure is just as an overview, essentially the heart contracts, the heart muscle the blood moves through the, the blood vessels and then nutrients, immune cells, and oxygens will reach all of the cells of the body. So blood pressure in its essence is a measurement of the pressure within the cardiovascular system, specifically the blood vessels. So any pressure in the vessels uh, is the, the highest pressure is measured when the heart contracts. The lowest pressure is measured when uh, in between beats, in between contracting, and that's what's known as our systolic versus our diastolic blood pressures. So the arteries and veins look a little bit different. As you can see on the left-hand side here is an artery. On the right-hand side is a, is a vein. The arteries are a lot more uh, springy, and that's because you see all this yellow, uh, these yellow layers, which are the elastic layers, elastic membranes within the arteries, which allows for when the heart contracts them to have some elasticity to help kind of move the blood all the way to the periphery of the body. It comes back through the veins, which are less elastic. Uh, but they both have muscular layers around them to help with propelling this action. What's interesting is in the middle is a whole network of very, very small vessels where arteries become veins and the blood is working its way through those very small artery, that, that um, capillary network is what it's called, uh, is also moving through those really small, small areas uh, every day, uh, five liters of blood per minute. So how can we control blood pressure? 
Um, ultimately, it's a lot of mechanisms can impact blood pressure, which, whether it's high or low. Uh, there's a complex interplay of various systems of the body. Of course, the heart vessel, the heart and the vessels, cardiovascular system, the nervous system, uh, including your sympathetic tone, which is your fight and flight nervous system, the renal system, which are your kidneys, and we'll get into that a little bit later, as well as your hormonal system, the endocrine system. And we know additionally beyond our human cells, the microbiome has a lot to do with how the blood pressure is regulated, your external and internal environment, as well as just genetic predisposition. So something to gloss over here that I still think is quite important is essentially the math behind blood pressure. So essentially BP equals cardiac cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Cardiac output, it, sorry, cardiac output is essentially your heart rate, so how fast the heart is beating, and then how strong it's it's pumping out the blood, which is what is known as stroke volume. So that's one piece here. The heart rate is impacted by the nervous system. If you're feeling stressed, the heart rate goes up. The stroke volume is impacted by the muscle cells of the heart, as well as the amount of volume of blood moving around. So that's one piece of the puzzle. The second piece is the systemic vascular resistance. So if you think back to the picture before, that area where there's the capillary network, the arteries make, meet the veins, the really small vasculature, uh, that's part of your systemic vascular resistance. Uh, it's impacted by how thick the blood is and how, uh, how large or small the blood vessel diameters are. Um, and lastly, another big piece is the kidneys have a lot to do with blood pressure. Uh, they secrete renin, which is a, um, it's a specific molecule especially made in the kidneys that uh, is part of a chain reaction that regulates blood pr pressure because the kidneys are actually a sensor for the body that tells the body whether the blood pressure is high or low. So here again is just a visual describing that blood pressure equals that cardiac output piece and times the systemic vascular rate. On this right-hand side, the image shows uh, some athero atherosclerosis plaques, which are macrophages or type of immune cells that build up on uh, the internal part of, of the arteries, essentially leading to a smaller diameter blood vessel and hence an increase in blood pressure. Another piece we have to think about with blood pressure is something called the nitric oxide system. And this is really affecting many areas in the body. Specifically, when we think about blood pressure, we're focusing on this ENOS system. And ENOS stands for the endothelial, which means the inside lining of the blood vessels and how they're affected by nitric oxide. Now, the big cardiovascular effects from nitric oxide is that it's going to actually allow those blood vessels to relax. So it's a chemical that the body senses and says, okay, blood vessels, relax here. And so we want to know about this because we can use natural substances that affect this ENOS system and increase ENOS for the body, which can be really important when we're regulating blood pressure and reducing some of our risks. Now, specifically, we care about blood pressure because high risks can occur when blood pressure is not managed. Specifically, when we're talking about high blood pressure, we see things like stroke. And oftentimes, there can even be issues with silent strokes happening for people who are walking around with high blood pressure. So it's one of the main reasons when you go and see your practitioner, your um, physician, 
you'll often have blood pressure checked as part of your general screening exam because we want to know if that blood pressure is going to be doing damage continually to the inside of those, those vessels. And then we also see higher risk with heart disease whenever the blood pressure is higher as well, because remember, this is causing more of an effort when that cardiac output is being stressed. And then we see, of course, the vessel disease because of the damage of that higher pressure um, going through of the blood volume, going through those vessels, kidney disease, because remember those kidneys are filtering so much of this blood, one fifth of your blood every minute, how incredible. So as the kidneys have more um, job that they have to do more of this clearance that they have to do of the blood from the pressurized system, more damage can be happening on those microstructures. And then eye disease. So we know that the vessels in the eyes are very fine and they can also be damaged after prolonged blood pressure exposure. So those are the areas we're really thinking about as well as sexual organ dysfunction. So we see this with erectile dysfunction being very tied in with high blood pressure for many. Now, when we're talking about too low of blood pressure, we also have issues. We can have issues with fainting and dizziness, for example. We can also have issues cognitively or even with distribution of nutrients for the body. Because remember, if the body is not circulating its blood, it's not circulating those nutrients as effectively. So we do care about blood pressure and we want to monitor it and how cool we can do that with a standard blood pressure cuff. And there are many different blood pressure cuffs. So if you're looking for one at home, make sure that you get one that you enjoy. There are wrist cuffs as well as arm cuffs in the, um, you know, in a practitioner's office, you may even have blood pressure taken on your leg at times. So what we're looking at for these normal numbers, and this is taken from the American Heart Association here, the standard that we're generally looking for for an adult is looking at the systolic, which remembers that's the pressure when the heart is contracting. So it's the higher pressure number, the systolic being less than 120. And then during the diastolic, which is when those chambers of the hearts are in between beats and more relaxed, that blood pressure goes down to something less than 80. So that's in the normal range. Once we see it elevate a little higher than that, just by 10 points here in the systolic, it's considered to be slightly more elevated. And then we start getting into trouble ranges here when the blood pressure goes much above 130 typically, although there is some age differentiation here. So we do have some different numbers for folks who are over 65 often seeing a blood pressure for them in the 130s is still considered more of a, a normal blood pressure. But when we get into the numbers of over 140 or higher for that systolic, that first number that's reported, then we start getting into real problem stages where there can be chronic damage that's happening often. And we don't want to see that diastolic, that second number over 90 or higher. Then there's something called a hypertensive crisis. And this is something that often you need to go seek immediate medical attention for. So that's when you see that blood pressure going over 180. And then if you see that second number going over 120 for that diastolic number. So how do you accurately get your blood pressure checked? And we just wanted to take a second to talk about this because so often, even in the doctor's office, this might be rushed through this process and it might be done incorrectly. So when you're doing it at home, think about some of these little tips here. And same thing when you go into your doctor's office. So generally... 30 minutes before you're taking your blood pressure, you don't want to be smoking any uh, tobacco or vaping any tobacco because that affects blood pressure. You don't want to be having caffeine intake. So that includes your coffee, even a little bit of chocolate, tea, that kind of thing. You don't want to be doing 
exercise that 30 minutes before typically significant exercise. And then five minutes before you take your blood pressure, it's best to be taken sitting when, when you're sitting still. And then during that blood pressure monitoring, we want to make sure that you're keeping your, if you're doing it on your arm, you want to make sure that that arm is at surface level of the same level as your heart. You want to be sitting upright and not crossing your legs because that can affect blood pressure. And you don't want to be talking. So if you're yakking at your clinician when they're taking your blood pressure or talking to your spouse or, or a roommate while you're taking your blood pressure at home, that can affect those numbers. And you often want to make sure that the cuff is the right size. So that's kind of the starting point is making sure that the, the cuff size is lining up correctly. And there's little lines and directions on your cuff for how to correctly fit it. You also afterwards want to be keeping a log whenever you can and making sure that your device is accurate. So you can usually bring it into your clinician's office and have them do a check against their machine to make sure that those readings are accurate. And usually we have patients take those readings in a group of three and then take an average from those. So some symptoms of abnormal blood pressure is a wide variety of them. Uh, with low blood pressure, like Dr. Molly explained, you can have dizziness, lightheadedness, fainting spells, feeling fatigued. Oftentimes, this is something people notice when they have been sitting or squatting for a while, and then they suddenly stand up. That's something known as orthostatic hyper hypotension. So uh, I'm sure we've all experienced this at some point. What's interesting here is that the high blood pressure symptoms are often silent uh, and that it, it becomes uh, something that just gets monitored at, at uh, routine doctor visits. Um, but some symptoms of a, a much higher blood pressure include symptoms like headache, tinnitus or ringing in the ears, some, vi some vision changes or floaters in the vision. And erectile changes are one of the first things we see in our male patients who have hypertension, since um, men with hypertension are twice as likely uh, as their counterparts to have impaired penile blood flow. Um, and so this leads to erectile changes um, as compared to, to men with normal blood pr pressure. So a quick overview here on the pharmaceuticals that are available for um, blood pressure management, specifically high blood pressure. Uh, this is something we learned in med school, the A, B, C, D, E, or A, B, C, Ds of uh, hypertensive uh, pharmaceuticals. So A's are our angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors. These are ones that are kind of standard of care when you have high blood pressure an allopathic doctor will start you on these. Uh, the prior uh, generation of these drugs are, call, are called ARBs. Um, and ultimately, these are enzymes that cause your body's blood vessels to narrow. So your body pumps out these enzymes when it notices that the blood pressure is low. Uh, it's pathologic when these enzymes are actually being secreted, but you're having a high blood pressure reading. Beta blockers are a sort of a secondary place to start um, or a secondary addition to a, our pharmaceutical regimen. And these are the ones that regulate your heart rate um, and kind of protect the heart from stress hormones. Um, and so it very much has to do with heart arrhythmias and abnormalities. Um, these are not, like I said, not the first line ones we go for. Um, calcium channel blockers will diminish uh, calcium input ultimately to the blood vessels. This gives the blood more ability to flow through a dilated blood vessel. And then lastly, our diuretics ultimately diminish the blood volume. Those five liters of blood uh, per minute end up being diminished because there's more urinary output. So this is a handy chart to refer back to at some point. It's slide 15 here, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Uh, this ultimately tells us 
all of the enzymes that are or the big enzymes, at least that are involved in raising blood pressure. As you can tell, the lungs, the kidneys are involved, the liver, uh, and they all have a specific role in increasing blood pressure by secreting different enzymes. So you can see in the middle here, this ACE enzyme, and we inhibit that, we're diminishing blood pressure. Um, Again, all the way in the bottom here is just, again, different ways to think about what happens when the blood pressure is elevated and what it affects is just the whole body system is, is affected. So we wanted to do that little review just because it's important to understand the mechanism of blood pressure so we can think about ways that we're affecting it when we're making these natural changes, especially. We know that there are foods that can increase blood pressure. So this is very clear in the medical literature. Many of you have heard, of course, that high salt foods can have an impact on this. So we're specifically seeing those in a lot of packaged and processed foods. A lot of cheeses and sausages, cured meats use quite a bit of salt often for that curing process. We also see this with highly inflammatory foods reactions for individuals. So if there's an individual that is reacting to a food from an inflammatory process, that can be seen as a stress to the body and blood pressure can be affected and, and go higher. Um, we also can see this with synthetic food additives and chemicals. And once again, that's almost like a reaction, a stress reaction from, from body. And then food allergies and sensitivities, we can see this cause blood pressure changes. With dietary salts, we wanted to mention that these salts are not considered to be the, the same across the board. So natural salts are going to contain with them not just the sodium and the chloride, which makes up the salt molecule, but also a variety of micro minerals. And you can see this beautiful picture of the Himalayan pink uh, salt over here on the side. We have sea salt, which we're deriving a lot of those natural salts <coughs> in our foods, as well as we have um, things like Celtic salt and Himalayan salt. Also, we can have synthetic salts. Now, these are just the sodium and chloride molecules only, and they can put different additives in them to make them non-clumping. You guys might remember the, the non-clumping Morton salt, for example. And we also have iodine added to a lot of salts synthetically to help reduce iron, iodine deficiency issues that have been a nutritional issue in the U.S. for <clears throat> for quite some time. So that's one way that has been, you know, tried to use to address that. That being said, the body can react differently to these synthetic versus the natural salts. And we not have to note that there are some individuals that are particularly sensitive to salt met metabolism. And that's known as salt sensitivity in the medical literature. And we can see that in up to 32 to 64% of hypertensive people. And then in up to 50% of people who don't have high blood pressure are known to be salt sensitive when, when testing is done on them. So salt is something to be considering. Look at your ingredients list, consider the type of salts that are used in your foods. Here we have some nice research that um, came out basically saying like, you know, is a low site, a low, low salt diet going to be worth your time as a patient or as, as a person to really reduce hypertension? And we do see that it directly can affect the systolic blood pressure. So that's that first number when that heart is contracting. And so it is recommended that we're trying to keep our sodium intake for even people with normal blood pressure under 2000 milligrams of sodium a day. So if you're worried about your salt intake, take a second and fill out one of those um, food surveys online that will help you calculate how much salt you're getting in. So, Sleep quality also has a lot to do with hypertension. Um, and particularly, there's a good amount of research on insomnia uh, and hypertension. 
So the next slide shows a review in the literature from 2018 that describes, um, if you go, go to that next slide, Dr. Molly, that describes uh, how insomnia and hypertension are con connected. So what's cool about a systematic review is that it looks at a whole bunch of studies and kind of puts it together uh, in, in, in a, a kind of comparing them all. So ultimately the findings here indicate that when someone has frequent insomnia, uh, that's accompanied with short sleep duration, there is a strong association with hypertension and raised blood pressure. So it's worth noting that the better you sleep, the more prolonged your, your fully asleep times are, the less likely you are to have uh, high blood pressure. This is where it's really important when you do do a blood pressure log to have those uh, to take those different blood pressures at different times. Is it, you know, if you do end up waking in the middle of the night, what is the blood pressure then? What is it first thing in the morning? What What is it when you are feeling sleepy at night? Um, so this is just an interesting connection. So some uh, a tip here is to hack your sleep. Uh, make sure you're getting seven to nine hours a day. Um, and this involves making your room a Zen zone, so no electronics in the room. Electronics will uh, send out blue light, which specifically diminishes melatonin. Melatonin is supposed to help you sleep. Um, keeping a routine and a schedule, it really supports the circadian rhythm. Uh, having comfortable bedding, um, whether it's a mattress that fits your needs or a special pillow that supports the cervical spine. All of this is part of a, a helpful sleep routine in addition to avoiding caffeine afternoon and alcohol close to bedtime. Both of these things can play with your, your glycemic load uh, or how aroused you are at night uh, inability to fall asleep. Another note here on sleep quality is actually uh, sleep apnea additionally can contribute to hypertension. So sleep apnea is the phenomenon when, when you are sleeping, your intake of air is decreased by, you know, the, the structures of the mouth kind of uh, falling into, into the pharynx and the larynx a little bit um, so that there's less of an air input and thus less oxygenation. So What's curious here is that the worsening of the sleep apnea, we usually see a worsening of hypertension. Um, and so it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario, right? Are we, are we helping the sleep apnea to help the hypertension or is the hypertension support helping the sleep apnea? I think both of these are go hand in hand and it's an often overlooked piece in a, uh, in a, in a patient, for example, that has chronic hypertension. So this hack here, this tip has to do with um, supporting your breathing and breath retraining. Um, the co common myth is that taking bigger breaths oxygenates us more, but that's not true at all. It honestly has to do with the fact of how well and how slowly you are able to breathe in fully. Uh, it has to do with how well you are oxygenated. Nose breathing, it really supports the nitric oxide system that Dr. Molly um, discussed earlier. Remember the nitric oxide is that, um, is that um, connect, is, is that molecule ultimately that dilates the blood vessels um, so that you have less peripheral resistance and less hypertension. So light and deep tempo breathing is the type of breathing that is ultimately the most oxygenating type, uh, as well as in Ayurvedic medicine, alternate nostril breathing. Uh, so if you don't have some sort of breath work on board as part of your routine, I highly recommend looking into this a little bit further. And we did an entire talk on breath work and another one on sleep. If you want to go back and look at those, if those are your issues, we 
would be silly not to talk about the importance of exercise in regards to hypertension. It is so critical. And as holistic physicians, we really want to make sure that we are having our patients being encouraged to be moving their bodies. And this makes such a tremendous difference. So making sure that we're having a dynamic set of exercise. So everything from aerobic exercise to resistance exercise can make a big difference in the management of hypertension. And this is just a more recent article from 2018, where they're talking about how it's an absolute important tool that's a little harder than just getting a pill, but can make a much better impact on overall cardiovascular um, output and um, health. So we wanted to make sure that we're reminding you all to incorporate the exercise piece, making sure you're not pushing yourself too much because remember too much overtraining can be seen by the body as a stress response, which could be potentially more damaging for blood pressure. But we want to make sure we are engaging our cardiovascular system. We're aiming typically for uh, 10,000 steps a day. And we want to be thinking about varying our types of exercise, including flexibility and strength training, including weights potentially core exercises, as well as the aerobic exercises that are going to get our heart rate up a little bit more and our breathing a little bit quicker. And then remembering to incorporate things that we um, abbreviate to be called NEAT, which is basically doing activities that normally um, wouldn't be considered exercise, but changing them slightly so that you're getting some therapeutic um, movement or exercise through that. So it could be something like while you're sitting, sitting on a yoga ball or something like that at work, or possibly engaging your core um, more while you are doing some other activity, uh, bending down to get something out of your kitchen and, and engaging your core, and then doing things like parking slightly further away when you're walking to and from your destination. Very important to us is this deep impact that blood pressure has on the brain. And we know that blood pressure irregularities are linked to neural inflammation. And that's a huge deal for us as more functional medicine doctors. We like to really think about this deeper impact of how it's cognitively affecting our patients and potentially doing longer term damage. And remember, these are preventable things if we can get that blood pressure under control. So here's a study from 2022 that is linking hypertension with the mechanism that they believe is involved in increasing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, with things like dementia and Alzheimer's disease, these are so uh, impactful for patients when they're dealing with memory loss and their lives are so irrevocably changed that if we have ways of preventing our risk factors from going up, we really want to be thinking about, um, you know, engaging in those things. So getting that blood pressure under control so that we don't have activation of those glial cells, which we know are involved in inflammation and perpetuating problems like Alzheimer's disease. So additionally here, uh, when it comes to blood pressure irregularities and the brain is this research on hypotension and its effect on the brain. So here specifically, we're seeing that orthostatic hypotension. Remember that that change from seated to standing where you feel dizzy and low blood pressure symptoms. Frequent orthostatic hypotension is associated with an increased risk of dementia. Uh, and so this is especially seen in our, our patients who already have a neuroinflammatory disease like Parkinson's, uh, or multiple sy system atrophy. And what's really, really interesting is that uh, there has additionally been some research on pharmaceuticals uh, that diminish blood pressure uh, being linked with dementia as well. Uh, this is something that, that I've read recently as well in terms of 
too much blood pressure management can lead to uh, issues in the brain. The brain is not getting enough oxygen or immune cells or feedback uh, to feed the, to feed those that nervous tissue. And so, you know, here's a quick quick slide on this orthostatic hypotension. Uh, and ultimately, I do see a good amount of patients who come in with that complaint. It's not high blood pressure for them, but it's more like low blood pressure. Uh, it's the, bod the body's inability to raise the blood pressure quickly enough when you have a change in positioning. So this can be just due to a sort of a biochemical anatomy dysfunction of a type of cell known as the baroreceptor cell. It's located in the arteries of the neck. Those are sort of the mechanical parts of the body that notice when there's a change in blood pressure and a lowering. And so if there's a dysfunction in those cells, then the rest of the body doesn't quite know how to increase the blood pressure. Um, some other causes that are very common of low blood pressure include dehydration. Remember, we want five liters per minute of blood that's filtering through the heart. Um, it's about 180 liters a day uh, total. Uh, Postprandially, which means after meals, we often get a lowering of the blood pressure. Heart problems, the heart contractility piece, uh, whether it's a, a very dilated heart or valve problems, um, and lastly, endocrine problems. And specifically, I see this with adrenal glands, adrenal insufficiency, meaning the adrenal glands are not able to pump out enough cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And as we know, stress will increase uh, blood pressure. So a good way to help sort of normalize these changes, especially if you are having frequent orthostatic hypotension, is this nervous system hack where you are actively adding in on the daily some time to de-stress, do some mindfulness practices um, in nature, earthing with, with your feet on the ground. Uh, all of this will help regulate your nervous system, your fight or flight as compared to your rest and digest nervous system. Um, all of this is very closely tied into the vagus nerve, which we'll go in, in next uh, into detail next here. So the vagus nerve is a cranial nerve, meaning it originates in the brain and it goes and attaches to the diaphragm, which is the big flat muscle underneath your, your lungs that help you breathe in and out. Uh, and what's interesting about this nerve is it actually has four arms. One of them is voluntary. One of them is involuntary. Another arm is the uh, fight or flight nervous system. And the last arm is the rest and digest nervous system. So this is the only nerve in the body where you can actually voluntarily get yourself out of, re uh, out of fight and flight and into rest and digest by using breath work, by stimulating the muscle, that diaphragm under the lungs. So these are ways to stimulate the vagus nerve, controlling the stress, focusing on the gut, uh, having some cold exposure on board, like uh, cold plunging, uh, deep belly diaphragmatic breathing activates that vagus nerve, singing, humming, even the gag reflex will activate the vagus nerve, daily exercise, especially swimming where you're having to do some breath control or yoga and acupuncture as well. Additionally, we see that the microbiome has a deep impact on blood pressure management for the body. And this is just so cool to us um, as naturopathic doctors. We're so very interested in the microbiome, the microbiome and how it's interacting with the body and what we can do to restore balance within our microbiome to reset homeostasis for the body. So with this study, it was really cool. It came out in 2022. What they did is they summarized a whole bunch of other studies that had been put, put together where there had been multiple treatments for hypertension specifically based on changes made to the gut microbiome. And this included things like fecal transplants, 
where they were actually doing transplants of different microbiomes into the, the gut. This um, also involved studies where they used uh, probiotics directly given orally and prebiotics, as well as antibiotics to affect the microbiome and then different dietary supplements. And what's so neat about the study is they were able to come up with a pretty concise list of what we've seen so far in the medical literature for what decreases blood pressure. And you can see lactobacillus and acromansia and bifidobacteria being among some of those most important and very commonly used supplementary probiotics, and then blood pressure um, supportive, things that help increase the blood pressure. So these are all very impactful. And just another reminder that the, the topic of blood pressure is so broad in what can be ultimately affecting your blood pressure. So if you haven't gotten your microbiome really balanced, that is going to be impacting you. Something we use at our office quite a bit with patients is a PCR stool analysis. So this is a DNA amplification test that's looking at stool samples to figure out what our patients are colonized with. That means the good bacteria, the commensal keystone bacteria, that's where we see our lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, for example, and the acromansia bacteria, and then the more pathogenic and then opportunistic bacteria, as well as other microbes that could be impactful as well. So if this is something that you're concerned about and you're dealing with hypertension, especially resistant hypertension, that's not being addressed as well as you'd like it to be, with um, other options and make sure that this is um, a consideration. So additionally, there's bigger food groups that can be linked to an increase in blood pressure. And there's a study here, a meta-analysis from 2017 on, on the next slide that describes both an inverse association and a positive association. So an inverse association means the food groups uh, listed were inversely associated with hypertension. So if you are eating 30 grams of whole grains, 100 grams of fruits, 28 grams of nuts, 200 grams of dairy, those were the food groups that were uh, associated with lower blood pressure. The positive association groups were 100 grams of red meat, 50 grams of processed meat, 250 milliliters of sugar sweetened beverages per day. So all of these are per day dosings. So for example, we see a big association of high blood pressure being associated with red meat, especially processed meat and sugars um, coming from sugar sweetened beverages. So tip here is, again, I think we harp on this. Each doc talk is just aiming for an anti-inflammatory diet. <laughs> and specifically when it comes to hypertension, one that is low in salt, low in processed foods. Uh, think about your macros eating macrobiotically. High in plant fiber, low in red meat, including a diminishment of processed meat. Um Probiotic rich foods to support that microbiome, especially wild fermented ones that are high in lactobacillus, low sugar diet uh, that is high in potassium. Again, that's the that is the alternate uh, agent to sodium, right? Sodium chloride being salt and potassium chloride being a different type of salt that's uh, essentially better uh, in, in for the cardiovascular system in lowering blood pressure. The goal dietarily is to, uh, if you are, if your goal is to increase your blood pressure, if you're someone struggling with chronically low blood pressure, we've got to do some electrolytes, including some higher sodium content than you would expect. We have so many tools in the, in the natural arena for managing blood pressure in regards to different nutraceuticals. We have a in-store apothecary here at Prosper Natural Health. We also have an on online presence um, with three different e-store um, options for folks if they're interested in these. Now, 
when we're thinking about natural hypertensives, there are so many different categories of action. As we've just shown you, it's a very complex system for what's con controlling and contributing to blood pressure. There's everything from these genetic factors to hormonal and environmental and issues with the cardiovascular system, narrowed um, vessels, all these kind of things, as well as that, um, the, um, nervous system as well, right? That sympathetic nervous system. So we want to be thinking about what it is when we're choosing an option for our patients, what it is that that, that um, natural agent is doing for the body when we're deciding how to address the hypertension. And this is a really, there was a really cool study that came out pretty recently where they took several different herbal remedies that have been known to affect blood pressure and control it for hypertense, hypertension and reduce blood pressure. And they were able to identify what the actions of those were. And this is just a great reference slide. So some of these that you're going to see and hear us chat about a little bit here today are going to be things like you'll see Raulfia, which comes up and this affects these amines, um, it, this amine depletion. And that this is actually one of the first herbs that was used to create its own pharmaceutical for controlling blood pressure back in the 50s. This was a huge deal. And then we also have things that you may notice some of these herbs on here. Andrographis is a really common herb. Allium, so that's our onion family. We see ginger on this list here, and we see crotagus. And each of these are doing very specific things, some, some similar to our pharmaceuticals with these calcium ion channel blockers, others that are affecting the endothelial, that inner lining of the vessels, some that are actually ACE inhibitors. That's where we see nigella sativa and tribulus. And then some that are scavengers as antioxidants that are doing repair work, cleaning up the, the vessels um, to reduce that hypertension. So here's a neat article on turmeric specifically. Turmeric is something that we utilize quite a bit in our clinic. It has a few different actions that we love. One, it's a very strong anti-inflammatory. It's also a really great antioxidant. So we like those pieces as reducing some of the damage to the body and actually mending it at the same time. It also is known to affect the vascular smooth muscles. So that means that that ability to contract on those vessels, which is going to affect blood pressure. So it is known to be a hypertensive. Additionally, it's a blood thinner. So that means that the blood is going, the blood viscosity goes down, the blood can move through the vessels easier, which lowers that blood pressure as well. We also know that magnesium is a very well-established mineral as a hyper anti-hypertensive and this study just came back and out in 2021, and it's pretty cool because it was giving specific amounts for daily use of magnesium to treat um, folks with blood pressure issues, whether or not they're on antihypertensive medications. Because remember, we have so many patients who are coming to us either already on hypertensive pharmaceuticals or who may need them for control of their blood pressure to reduce damage in a more immediate state, we have to be able to think about how to interact some of these supplements and minerals with those folks. We have many different um, products that we'll use once again for hypertension, but we just wanted to highlight some of our favorites here. We have um, this the several of the turmerics here towards the bottom. You can see the curcumin absorb and the curcumin veil. Those are going to be two different, they're both curcumin extracts, but one is in a capsule form and, and one is in a gel form. And that just depends on the person's digestive system and dosing issues as far as which one we may be um, suggesting. You'll see that there are two products here which are 
kind of interesting because they work specifically on that ENOS system, that beautiful nitric oxide system, which helps relax that the vessels. We have the nitric balance here by Apex Energetics at the bottom, and you can see that Basinox um, HP by Designs for Health up towards the top. And both of those have been shown to increase that endothelial nitric oxide system from the um, the constituents inside of those. The Ayush Herbs Cardotone is one that we'll often use with our patients, and we're very careful about initiating this one, but it contains Raulfia, and it's one that's a stronger acting uh, nutraceutical for hypertension. So this herb has been shown not only, when I was doing a ton of research for this, it was pretty cool to see that not only does it lower blood pressure risk, but it also reduces overall cardiovascular risk. So it's got some cool anti-inflammatory effects to um, its action as well. We have our magnesiums there and you can see that magnesium glycinate down there, which is very easy on the gut, as well as potassium, because as Dr. Rosalie mentioned, potassium is such an awesome option as well as a mineral for reducing blood pressure in some people, and especially if they're not on a potassium sparing diuretic and they're on um, the, you know, certain pharmaceuticals, they'll need to have some potassium coming in as well. And then we have, there's a product called um, Hypertension HTN um, Supreme, which has dried bonito, which has been studied to show it reduces blood pressure, as well as um, a polyphenol from grapeseed extract. And polyphenols are going to do a dual action of helping with that blood pressure be lowering, and then also protecting that endothelial lining from further damage. Because remember, if we've been dealing with hypertension, blood pressure issues for a long period of time, just that force of those cells going through is going to increase that risk for placking to be laid down, narrowing of those arteries, which ultimately risk of stroke um, results from that. So the last little tip here that we'll end on is uh, this research article on mindfulness and hypertension. So this is specifically speaking to the... Um, the fight or flight nervous system and controlling that as being a, a way to diminish blood pressure. And something I tell my patients is, you know, they might have a normal blood pressure in office, but it's in the moments that they're really stressed. That's when I actually want to know what, how high does their blood pressure go? Because it tells me ultimately that stress relationship to blood pressure. And those are the moments that are, that are, yeah, that are at higher risk for um, cardiovascular events. So this study described, um, it's from 2024, just at last or two months ago now. Um, it is a meta-analysis. So again, it's a review of all that's available in terms of uh, randomized control studies that has this specific clinical question in mind. What are the mindfulness techniques? How well does it help with hypertension? And ultimately what they found is a favorable uh, result from looking at all of these multiple studies, 802 studies in total, uh, that favored that mindfulness-based interventions are uh, helpful for um, decreasing blood pressure. Um, most profound effects of it are seen on participants with higher uh, initial blood pressure reads. And this is true for uh, regardless of gender, regardless of how high the blood pressure was. So just really cool stuff. This you can start, you know, today, uh, you don't need a supplement for it. It's something you can do in, in, in your bedroom um, so here's a, here's some ways to get you started is to have a clear, uh, exciting purpose for your life. This is kind of an existential, uh, uh, way of thinking about it, but it is, it is part of the essence. If part of your mindfulness practice is kind of finding that, uh, in Japanese culture, this is what's known as the Ikigai. Uh, if you do a quick Google research on that, you can get a sense for, for what we're talking about. Um, 
taking time in nature again, taking time to connect, uh, all of this is are things that really get you out of fight and flight um, and back into your rest and digest um, happy place. Keeping a gratitude journal or having some sort of uh, check-in with yourself or the people around you um, in regards to what you're grateful for really is helpful. EFT techniques are really amazing. This is this is what's known as tapping. And there's certain spots on the body you can tap that really kind of reteach the nervous system and the brain ultimately to calm back down, getting you out of fight and flight. Um, having a mindset that's more growth-based as compared to um, a fixed mindset, that's this is this is really important. There's an excellent book in this regard. Um, by Carol Dweck. It's called Mindset specifically. So if you want some further reading in that regards, so that's a great place to start. And lastly, meditation, prayer. This is also mindfulness, a moment in the day where you are, uh, yeah, where you're just taking, taking a breather um, for yourself. These are all excellent ways to, um, to diminish your blood pressure. So if you're having issues with your blood pressure and regulation of that, whether it's too high or too low, feel free to reach out to us. You can set an appointment online or you can give us a call and um, we'd be happy to come up with a treatment plan and really go through what might be happening for you in regards to your physiology, whether it's something that's genetically related or is happening because of stress or your environment or your nervous system or even your microbiome, we're here to kind of help you figure out what that is. Maybe it's an issue with your kidneys. Maybe it's an issue with the way that you're breathing. So that's that's what we love to do. So we're 